All right, let's get going. It's time for another exciting mo morning, no, afternoon of organic chemistry with your host, me, Dr. Y. And today we'll continue on with amine chemistry. We'll also do the carboxylic acid lab and we'll get out early today because it's Wednesday. If we were at ECC, it would be a lab day. We'd have 50 minutes of lecture. You do the lab. I do my 20 minute introduction to the lab. And you go in the lab and have some fun. And I make sure you don't do anything dangerous. And also, I go around and tell students what they're doing so they understand so they do have fun. Unfortunately, that part we can't do. But luckily, I've given you that experience online with also some of the YouTube stuff. Oh, one thing I do want to mention, I'll put on the email. Of you. Uh, first of all, as of this morning, I think I've caught up with all the labs people have handed in. If I'm missing a score from you, go look in uh, D2L. If I'm missing a score, let me know by email because I, I was working this morning trying to catch up on everything because of many things happening, especially like with my back and also other things I've been involved in. Uh, I fell a little behind. And part of the thing is, if we were at ECC, I'd be handing back the labs that you handed in last week, even though I noticed I made a mistake on the due date for last week's lab that was due last week that I put today. That's okay with the things going on with the virus, uh, I've sort of, how should I say, went with the flow and understand life is more challenging now for all of us. So I'm not going to get, I'm going to take off point. Ooh, look at that. That's my, I'm getting angry look, which I try never to do. But anyways, make sure you hand in the labs if you haven't email them to me if you can't put them in through uh, D2L. Also, I mentioned on Monday, but I'll do it again today. Next Monday, we'll go through the uh, carboxylic acids and esters problem set. Ooh, that reminds me something. Did any of you pick up a bottle of vinegar? and look and see, oh, it has acetic acid, and that's a carboxylic acid. Did you pick up a bottle of ketchup and look, it has vinegar, which has acetic acid, which is a carboxylic acid. So does mustard, so does your pickles, so does your relish. Did you realize most of your condiments are acidic that you put on hamburgers and hot dogs? Interesting. Or, did you happen to smell perfume and think of esters? Organic chemistry is all around you and it won't hurt to think about it when you're not in my Zoom lecture. By the way, this I stole from SpongeBob. All right, let's get going. Now, on Monday, I went through these reactions, and these reactions are alkylation, putting an alkyl group on a nitrogen. And they all are based on the same thing, that there's a non-bonding pair of electrons that are always looking for a positive charge. They bond to the carbon with the halogen, and you lose a hydrogen X, HX acid, which is why we have the base. And I've already done primary amines from ammonia. I did secondary amines, and I did a few examples of tertiary amines. So let's do one more, maybe two, because as you've learned by now, repetition is good for your grade. And by the way, if you get a good grade, I get what I want, because You've learned organic chemistry. See how sneaky Dr. White is? Also, I was a student too. It's more important I cared about my grade than what I was learning. 
was until graduate school that switched around. All right. Ooh, I'm having a good writing day. Look out. All right. I'm going to let you try this because we already went through this. What would be the organic product or products or volume reaction? And when you're done, give me a thumbs up or smile. Or do both. Or make a funny face or something different. I know one person is done. I'm quite amazed that how well, and maybe I'm being a little overboard on this and how well I've mastered doing online lectures. They come out pretty good. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's take a look at this. When you're doing a chemical reaction, look at a molecule and say what's different. What's not carbon, what's not hydrogen, what's not a carbon-carbon single bond? Ooh, a nitrogen. It's got two R groups on it. It's a secondary mean. In this case, both R and R prime are methyl. What's, ooh, a halogen on a carbon? That's an alcohol halide. And remember, X for these reactions can be chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And when you react it in the presence of base, the base neutralizes the acid form and you'll learn a little while later today why that's important. And what happens is the non-bonding pair attack the carbon with the halogen, this leaves, you lose an H, HX, which is neutralized by the base. Actually, I should have double prime. And that's what you get, a tertiary mean. Now, What's our prime, double prime? Isopropyl. Remember the bond from nitrogen to the carbon in our double prime, or in any R group when you're doing this type of reaction, is to the carbon with the halogen. In that case, it's the center one. So what's attached to the nitrogen to begin with is still there, and then I form this new carbon-nitrogen bond. And if you notice, you could also have written it this way. Organic chemists usually don't because we're lazy. And both are the same, dimethyl isopropylamine or isopropyl dimethylamine. Now, on test three, like on test two, I'll have three or four synthesis problems. I better write it soon. And the question would be, what would be the two starting materials that you would react with base to make this compound? Have some fun.
it's one of you, two of you are getting real good at organic chemistry. And the third one, well, you don't have your video on, so I can't tell. All right, looks like everybody's done. I'll give you another 5.6 seconds. 5.2, 5.3, I got a slow watch, 5.6. All right, let's take a look at this. First of all, what's the, ooh, a nitrogen. And if you notice, I have two R groups here, another alkyl group here. So I have a tertiary amine. What do you react to make a tertiary amine in the presence of base? A secondary amine plus an alkyl halide. Now X here can be chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And since I didn't give you anything here to help you determine, you could pick any one of those three. Now, let's call the two methyl groups R and R prime. Second, that looks like a plus and shouldn't. I feel better. And I'll call this right here our double prime. If that's the case, then R and our double prime are methyls. So I could draw it this way. And then our prime, double prime, is ethyl. And I haven't used iodine. You could also put bromine chlorine there. And that's how you do it. But wait, there's another way you can do it. What if I call one of these R and the other one R double prime, and I call this ethyl R prime? Well, in that case, R, my secondary amine would be a methyl, an ethyl, and remember for primary, secondary, tertiary amines, there's three bonds to nitrogen, so I have my hydrogen. And then my R triple prime, double prime, getting ahead of myself, is a methyl. And I could put iodine, chlorine, or whatever. And the question is, which one is correct? A or B? And the answer is they're both correct. Now, you don't know stuff that I do which is called cost accounting. And I think I'm one other faculty member at ECC. At the other school I work at, none of them know accounting, cost accounting. If you worked in industry at my level, you learned it. And I know this is cheaper than these chemicals per pound. And therefore I'd go with A for doing it in a chemical plant only because it costs less money and it maximizes your profit. But I don't expect you to know that because all the faculty, except maybe one, I don't think, I don't know if he works in with the means, uh, but he might, would know that. Now, if we look at the tertiary mean we've made here, it still has non bonding electrons, which means they can react. Let's go to the next reaction. And that's the reaction of a tertiary amine with an alkyl halide, R triple prime X. Remember, X can be chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And this now attacks that. But because it's already used up its three bonds, and for this new bond, nitrogen supplies both electrons, it has a positive charge. Well, all molecules need a net zero charge, so I need an anion with a cation. And this is called a quaternary a 
ammonium salt. And now you're on very sacred hell ground for Dr. White, because I'm an expert, world expert in this. I have nine US patents. A uh, number of my molecules that I invented are still being made years after I discovered them and created them. I didn't really discover them. I don't like using, I shouldn't use the word discover. Sounds like you're walking along, pick up the rock. Oh, look what's underneath. No, I created them. And Dr. White loves quaternary ammonium salts. I mean, big time. So let's look at how to do this reaction. And the question would be, and I'll do this one, you know, I'm going to share later on. What would be the product or products, for organic product or product for a following reaction? So let's look at the first thing here. Let's get the right color ink. I don't know why it changed it on me. And we have a tertiary amine. And I call these R and R prime. I call that our double prime. And then I look over here, what's different? A carbon with a halogen, that's the alcohol halide, and I'll call that our triple prime. Remember, X can be chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And now, what do you get? You get a quaternary ammonium salt. Notice Dr. White's been a good boy because I haven't used slang, which we all do if you're working in this area and call them quads. Oh, I used it. I said I wouldn't use it. And this would be what you get. Now, in real life, you can have other anions, and there are other reactions you can use what a tertiary mean, but that's another course, a higher level course. So if we look at here, here's our, our triple prime. And one way of drawing it would be this. Notice I'm going to add a methyl group. I have two of them. So I could draw it like this. By the way, you don't have to put charges. I do, because I think it's cool. Now, another way you could have also drawn it, which would have been perfectly correct, Now we put the chlorine on the right here, that's this convention. This chlorine is not bonded to that methyl group. It's bonded by an ionic bond to the nitrogen, but that's where we put it. And that's how you do it. And now I'm gonna let you have some fun too. Remember always the bond from the nitrogen goes to the carbon with the halogen. It's your turn. What would be the organic product or product for the following reaction? Three points each.
I think everybody's done. Is everybody done? All right, let's do this one. And the question is, what's the product or products you get? And look for what's different, what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen. Ooh, nitrogen there. And what is that? It's a tertiary amine. There are two plus one, three alpha groups are our prime, our double prime. Over here, what's the, ooh, carbon with a halogen, alkyl halide. I'll call that our triple prime. Remember, X can be chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And in the presence of base, make a quaternary ammonium salt. So I have the two ethyl groups I can call R and R prime. My methyl group I'll call R double prime. And this right here, my isopropyl group, I'll call R triple prime. And therefore, I can write it this way. This is one of many ways you could write it. There still will be two ethyl groups and the methyl group on there. And the new group, remember, goes to the carbon with the halogen is isopropyl. This has a plus charge, so don't forget the ion, the anion. And that's how you would do it. That's one way of writing it. You have diethyl, methyl, isopropyl ammonium iodide. Iodide. I don't know if I wrote this down, but I should do this now. For quaternary ammonium salts, Cl minus is chloride. Br minus is bromide. And Iodine minus, I minus is iodide. Who said that five times quickly? And you should know this. Because you need that to name quaternary ammonium salts. Now, it's time to talk about something very sacred and very hallow for Dr. White, and that's the following reaction. Now, I'm going to use a different R group, R sub T. I'll teach you later on. This means tallow or tallow alcohol, and that's an R group that has 16 or 18 carbons with or without a double bond. And we have two of them plus a methyl group. And if we react this with methyl chloride, again, this is very sacred. In the presence of base, this is a tertiary amine. Here we have what's different, a halogen on a R group, tertiary alkyl halide. Remember, X can be chlorine bromine or iodide and the presence of base you get a quaternary ammonium salt and the r groups can be all the same or different that's why i use the different primes it has a positive charge so you need an anion so all molecules have a net zero charge so if i call this r and our prime, call this, oops, extra prime there. I'll call this methyl group our double prime. And here I'll call this our triple prime. What is, let's move over here so I have more space. And I'll draw it this way.
I have two tallow alpha groups, one methyl, and I'm going to put on another so two methyl groups. My anion is chloride. And this is ditalo, dimethyl ammonium chloride until about 10, 15 years ago when I was in the industry heavy. That was the only molecule used for fabric softener. And that molecule and that reaction paid my mortgage, allowed me to buy two cars, and also got me to Europe, Mexico, Canada. I was supposed to go to Japan, but they did something that got me truly upset. The people I was supposed to help out, they sent to Chicago. And I was all ready to go to Japan and Asia on a nice business trip, which would have been quite fun. And I didn't. Oh, was I upset. Now, this is a very important reaction for Dr. White. And And you should know it because this is the molecule that was used for many years for fabric softener. Do I? Have, oh, I have time. Now, this reaction we did to the tune of, I don't know how many, I think two or three million pounds a week we made when I was at AXO, maybe even more, probably more, I think. It's been a while. Now, our two biggest customers were Procter and Gamble, which is Downey, and Unilever, which was, it still is, Snuggle. Those are the two main brands of fabric softener. Now, here's an interesting story. I was in charge of all research, and also if there were problems, that was my responsibility for all the quaternary ammonium sales and products made in North America and South America. And one day I got a call from the VP of marketing and sales. And he called me and said, we got a problem. I said, what's wrong? I said, well, PNG just changed their formulation for Downey and we're getting feedback. Our product makes the new product smell bad. We're talking about uh, $80 million a year in business, which is not good. Whoa. And uh, by the way, any good company, and PNG is a good company, our competitor, they bought some from, they bought from us. So if we had problems, they could get more from our competitor. They had problems, they could buy more from us. Because you never want to just have one single source for important material, raw material, starting with, to make your product. Well, anyways, $80 million a year in sales and a high profit margin, you know what happened? I've talked to the salesman, he gave me the same story. We tried to figure out how to figure out why is it smelling bad? Because we hadn't changed anything. What they changed in the formula mainly was a slightly different perfume. So after the second day, when I got in my office at 7.38 in the morning, I got a call from the president of the company in the United States. At noon, I got another call from him. And before I left, I got a third call every day. And after about two or three weeks of this, I wasn't happy. He wasn't happy. Nobody was happy. And I realized I'm spinning my wheels. We tried all sorts of odor smelling. We got the formulation, raw materials that Downey used, and we couldn't smell anything bad. And there was a bunch of money, millions of dollars riding on it. Because they said, if you can't sell it, we're not going to buy from you. Well, I finally got to the point where I was going nowhere. And I called the sales manager who was working with the salesman with Procter & Gamble and said, I've got to talk to somebody at Procter & Gamble. And luckily I had a contact at my level at PNG, their research, and I called him up and he's a great guy. We worked well together. I said, this odor problem, who can I talk to? And he said, we got to talk to the perfumer. I've never, ever been allowed to talk to him. What? Well, I called the VP of marketing and sales and I had a meeting, a phone call meeting with him and the sales manager and the salesman and said, one of you got to get in and get me to able to talk to the perfumer at Procter and Gamble so I can solve this problem. 
because I'm lost. I can't, I, we've tried everything. So it took about two days and I got a call from a senior vice president of Procter and Gamble and said, because it's so important to have your company as a source of this chemical, we're going to allow you to talk to the perfumer in charge of this area. At that time, they had five senior perfumers who were in charge of all the products in Procter and Gamble. And their job was to make sure the way a product smelled yesterday will smell the same way today and will smell the same way tomorrow when you buy it. Because if you're a housewife and you buy something, it doesn't smell the same. There's something wrong with it. I'm going to complain to the company. I want my money back, which is not good. Well, it turned out these senior perfumers were treated like kings, even beyond that, like gods, because it was their nose. There's no chemical equipment. Even today, we can me measure some by what's called gas chromatography, but it's not as sensitive as the human nose. And their job was to do what I just told you, which m immense amount of money uh, was based on how good their nose is. So the senior VP told me, first of all, and I was smoking at the time, luckily I've given it off decades ago, but he said, if you're gonna, when you go to meet with them, you can't smoke for at least 36 hours before you meet with them. All right, I'll give it up for a day and a half. Next, if you get a mad, we're gonna just take, you're gonna lose all our business. Be very polite with him and just be very polite and we'll see if you can, he can help you solve the problem. And I said, with the meeting, the sales manager was coming in. They limited it to a small group. Can I bring my counterpart from P&G? And he said, no. I said, come on, he's important. He finally relented. This is someone in their own company. They wouldn't even let meet these people. That's how guarded they were. So I had a meeting. There were about eight people at the meeting and it was really just me and him. I can't remember his name, but he was a very nice person. I said, I've been told this is a problem. Our product now makes your product, your new formulation of downy smell bad. And he said, no, that's not right. I said, well, maybe that's why I can't solve the problem. I asked him, what is the problem? And I can still remember this decades later. And he said, I can picture myself right now if I close my eyes in that meeting, we were opposite sides of a conference table and it was just me and him and everybody else was just listening with bated breath because they're hoping we could solve it. And he said, the new formulation, your product makes the intensity of the perfume smell a little less than your competitors, which we want in the final product. I said, oh, now I understand. I said, all right, if I make some different formula uh, products and send it to you, can you make the formulations and smell it and tell me which one's working? Luckily at that time in our company, we had a great analytical chemist. I still remember him, Dr. Chunan Wei. And Chunan was an amazing guy, crazy like me. And we had fun together, but he could analyze anything. We'd gotten our hands on a sample of our competitors quaternary ammonium salt and ours. And he finally found there was this minor component that was different. And we're talking about ours was at 150 ppm parts per million. Theirs was at 50, which is not much, but that was the only difference he could find. Well, luckily I know chemistry and I'm not gonna go into how I did it in the actual, but I could bring our level that impurity down. I could affect it. I figured out how to do that. So we made it so it was zero. Sent a sample of perfumer. He said, no, it's not right now. Your smell's too strong. We matched the exact same level of that impurity in our competitor. We were on the president of the company, stopped calling me, thanked me for solving the problem. I felt better because I wasn't getting three calls a day from him. Have you solved the problem yet? What's What's going on? Get it done. And that was probably one of the hardest problems I did. But I remember one of the things I forgot to tell you, we're talking and after I, he told me what was wrong, we were talking a little longer. We took him out to lunch too. And 
I was very polite to him, and I got a call back from the senior VP of Procter & Gamble thanking me for being polite and later on for solving the problem. But we're still talking, and he said, you know some Yesterday, I smelled something so strong, it blew out my nose. I should have gone home. I couldn't smell anything. Nobody laughed. <laughs> you know, at first you think, oh, you blew out your nose. It's fun. No, he was being very serious. But that guy was one of the only five people that the quality of their products, all of Procter & Gamble, how it smelled based on his nose, which is pretty impressive. I hope you enjoy my stories. I've had a lot of interesting experiences in the chemical world. All right, let's get back to this. Let's do one more. And the question would be, what two things do react with base to make that molecule? How fun. Remember, Monday we'll be going through the carboxylic acid and esters problem set. I highly recommend you do that. On Monday, I haven't put out an email, I should have that we're no longer doing where you have to submit the problem sets. And I'll talk how I'm going to solve that or in the email. So you people all will get your points that I have figured into my syllabus, which next semester I'm going to admit because I, but anyways, and also those who actually did do it, I'll make sure I take care of you. Hint, hint, wink, wink, say no more. Oh, I just did a Monty Python thing. All right, looks like everybody's done. Is everybody done? All right, let's do this. Look for what's the, ooh, a nitrogen. And it's got four groups on it. It's a quaternary ammonium salt. And what do you react with base? to make a quaternary ammonium salt, a tertiary amine plus an alcohol halide. And notice X here can be chlorine, bromine, or iodine. If you notice here, you know X is going to be bromine. So how do you do that? Well. I'm going to be lazy and call my methyl groups R, R prime, and R, trip, R double prime. I'll call my N propyl group. I'll ring three more times, and my answering machine will pick it up. Have you noticed you're getting a lot of vote robocalls? I don't know who's the number, and I have on this Bluetooth phone all the numbers I know. And their name will pop up. I don't answer it. And if it's important, they can leave a voicemail message. All right, back to the work. So if this is the case, oops. our prime and our double prime and our triple prime are methyl, one way of drawing that. would be this tertiary amine. Our alkyl halide, the R triple prime, is this. Remember, the carbon with the nitrogen is the carbon that will have the halogen. I'll write it here. And that would be three carbons. Remember, you don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds. And the halogen is bromine. However, I could have said, Two of these methyl groups are R and R prime, and I'll call this N-propyl. 
our double prime, and the last methyl group here, I'll call our triple prime. In that case, my tertiary amine will be this compound, and my alkyl group on our X is a methyl group, and the halogen also here is bromine. Which one is correct? They both are. And if you did the cost accounting, the top one is cheaper than the bottom one, but that's because I know this stuff. And that's how you do quaternary ammonium salts. Now I'm gonna ask you to bear with me. I'm gonna go a little longer before we have the break because I wanna cover something now and then we'll do the lab and you get out early today. Oh, well, not early, but like we would. And that's the next reaction. And does everybody see reduction of a nitrile on this? Good. Now, I won't go into nomenclature and there are or IUPAC, but this is called a nitrile. And a nitrile has a triple bond, which is two pi bonds and one sigma bond. And from carbon-carbon triple bonds, you know you can break double bonds like that. Very easy, hold on, like that. And therefore, if I have hydrogen a catalyst, what happens is, ah, where the catalyst is, as you know before, nickel, platinum, or palladium. You break the two pi bonds, and here I didn't put it here, Dr. White was being a lazy organic chemist, use excess because that gives you all the hydrogen in the world, and each atom of the triple bond gets, ooh, this should be a nitrogen, sorry, gets two hydrogens. And this is a way of making a primary amine. That's a quite good way. In fact, the same company, AXO, did this reaction to the tune of about 5 million pounds a week for different amines they made. That's pretty, that's a lot of chemicals being processed. So let's look at an example. First of all, if you write that down. If I ask you what's the organic product or product for products for the following reaction, look for what's different. Ooh, carbon bonds and nitrogen. And you also have a triple bond. Remember, look for what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen, what's not a carbon-carbon single bond. And what is this a nitrile? Hydrogen excess catalyst. What's platinum? It's a catalyst, excess hydrogen. And remember the catalyst can be platinum, palladium, or nickel. And you break the two pi bonds. And each atom of the triple bond gets two hydrogens. Remember, you don't break carbon-carbon single bonds. Here's my R group, so I'll put that down. Then I'll have a carbon and a nitrogen. Each one has two hydrogens. And there you go, primary mean. And you could have written it this way on a test. And both are the same. Notice I start with three carbons. I better end up with three carbons. I still have the nitrogen there too.
and your turn give the organic product or product for a following. And by the way, while you're working on it, that odor problem was probably one of the toughest problems I ever had to solve in my life when it comes to chemistry. Those six weeks was not a fun time of my life until I solved it. By the way, when I solved it, I called up some friends and that Friday night we partied hard. Real hard. Oh, here's a funny thing. I hope nobody's offended by it. If you look, and I don't know if they're still in the building, I think they might be our buildings. If you look at the headquarters of Procter and Gamble in Ohio, I forgot whether it's at Columbus, I think, or I'm not sure is it Columbus or not. They have these two towers. They go straight up like cones and they were given a name. Dolly Parton Towers. I'll let you figure out why they call that. Uh, and also, I remember when they first built it, each floor didn't have any partitions, only a few, like little. Most of it was open space. And it was so noisy that they had to put in, after they built it, partitions for offices. They thought, oh, we'll have all uh, open space and at the time. That was a craze and it was a big mistake. I remember going there and it was so noisy. We just say, let's go to the research center in Sharonwood, which was outside of that, another town, and they had better facilities. All right, let's do this. What do we have that's different? Ooh, carbon, nitrogen, a triple bond. Nitrile. We have, ooh, we're reacting with hydrogen. Excess and a catalyst. And remember, a catalyst can be nickel, platinum, or palladium. And what happens? You hydrogenate, you break the two pi bonds, each atom of the triple bond gets two hydrogens, and that's what you get. What's R? These four carbons. Remember, you don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds. And then my carbon, nitrogen, I break the two pi bonds. And this is what you get. Now, I should tell you something personal about this reaction. When I first started in industry from academics, after I got my PhD and I postdoc for a year and a half being a postdoctoral fellow, when I started in industry at AXO, it was then called uh, RMAC. This was my first project. I was assigned to do the process development work to make this work in existing plant equipment, which was quite challenging because this gave off more heat than the plant equipment could remove by cooling. And so it didn't blow up. I had to find a way to do it. And I did, but I figured out also a brand new way what I was trying to make, they asked what we were trying to do was make short chain of means was the products AXO made, or our Mac, we believe it became AXO, was where R is anywhere from 11 to 20 carbons. Well, when R is four like this, this is a lot more heat given off and a little bit problems. And I found a whole new way of making short chain amines, 
which led to my first patent, made me a hero in the company and really improved my salary. True story. All right, let's take a break, come back at 2.05 and we'll do lab. Now I'm gonna go stretch.
right, let me get you all back. Time to start. All right, let's do one more of these and then we'll do the lab. And I'll get you out in about 15, 20 minutes, if not less. All right, let's take a look at the following. What would you react with hydrogen excess and palladium to make this compound? Your turn. All right, I think everybody's done. I'll give you another 4.7 seconds to finish up. Four. My hand doesn't want to work today. And 4.1, 4.3. Slow clock, 4.6, 4.7. All right, let's take a look. What's there? Ooh, a nitrogen and a carbon, but with hydrogen here. I'm going to write it as a primary amine, like this, or or like this. And what do you react with hydrogen excess and a catalyst? Remember the catalyst can be palladium, platinum, or nickel. You react a nitrile. So it's my R group isopropyl. And then this carbon bonded to the nitrogen will be part of the carbon nitrogen triple bond. And that's how you do it. Any questions on that? Like I said, I work for a company, AXO, or now it's called Nurion. Uh, that did this type of reaction out with this chemical, but other ones, this one right here, to tune about 5 million pounds a week. And I'll tell you later on uh, another problem I had to solve for them that wasn't as, how should I say, stressful, but it was still quite important and lucrative using this reaction. All right, everybody. It's lab time. Let's do our lab for today. First of all, I have to open it up. And this is in uh, D2L. Everybody see carboxylic acids lab on the screen? Good. 
All right, what's a carboxylic acid? And that's a molecule that has carbon double bond to oxygen, it also has a hydroxyl group and that carbon and an R group. These are called carboxylic acids. Now, having a oxygen that here is slightly negative and a hydrogen that's slightly positive would indicate that this should hydrogen bond to water. Remember water is this and this is the hydrogen bond. Take good notes or come back and watch the video later. As that's a plus of my posting a video, you can just concentrate on what I'm saying as opposed to taking notes. You can go back and do look at it again, take notes again. But this should help in the solubility of carboxylic acids. But this is a weak bond, hydrogen bond. And what you have to consider is how big is R? And you're going to find out, does that have an effect in the solubility of carboxylic acids in water? And if we we're in the lab, what you would do is take a small test tube, put some water in there, DI, deionized water, add each of the following carboxylic acids and observe, is it soluble or not? Do you get a homogeneous, it's the same throughout, or two layers heterogeneous? Well, you can't do that but I've done the data. Now, I didn't write up here, and I sometimes forget, but for here, And guess what? When we're in the classroom at e lab at EC, uh, ECC, I forget to write it in on some labs, but for acetic acid, prop propanoic acid, steric, and oleic, draw the structures here. And you can find these two. If you go to your favorite browser, mine is Google, put that name in there like steric acid, and afterward type chemical structure. And it will tell you, I don't want the empirical structure like C18, H, whatever, so many oxygen. I want the actual structures like we do showing carbon hydrogens. All right. And from this data, you'll be able to answer questions at the end. Let's move on to the next one. Now, a carboxylic acid. Oops, getting ahead of myself. That's a problem I sometimes have where I chess, my mind is moving about five steps ahead of what I'm going to say. Carboxylic acid, and you're going to react various carboxylic acids with sodium bicarbonate, which is also known as baking powder. And what you get, the general reaction, which we talked about, you get a carbox carboxylate anion. Water plus carbon dioxide, CO2, given off as a gas. That's what this arrow means right here. It's given off as a gas. Now, this is an acid. This is a base. And this is really an acid base neutralization. And I'd remind you that way of determining acidity or basicity is pH. And the pH scale, in case you forgot, goes from 0 to 14. And at seven, you're at neutral pH. 
below seven is acidic and above seven is basic. And if I'm telling you the truth, if you add sodium bicarbonate, the pH should go up. And in this lab, you'd measure the initial pH. And then after adding the sodium bicarbonate, you'd measure the final pH. And then you'd also observe this. And here we have some very dangerous chemicals you'd be working with acetic acid, which really is for this lab is vinegar. Lemon juice. Ooh, this is real dangerous tomato paste, plus stearic and oleic acid. Now on this table, you don't have to put the structures. This is done the first part. And I found a couple of interesting YouTubes. The second one, look at three minutes, 11 seconds into the video. How many of you remember I gave you that super good secret recipe my father used to make spaghetti sauce? The second video shows that. There actually, I think they said they're making pizza sauce now. At the very end, he put in a little sodium bicarbonate and that increases the pH. You'll find out if I'm lying, look at the table. But if you were in the lab, you'd actually see what's in that video. The first uh, YouTube is vinegar and baking powder. By the way, if you got vinegar and baking powder in your kitchen sink, mix the two together in a container and watch what happens. It's cool. Now you know I'm a chemist. See how smiling and happy I am? I am. And I, because we're not going in the lab because of the virus, blame it on the virus, but you can still do the vinegar and baking powder at home and have a nice fun time, do it in the sink. But I've given you all the data, but I would highly recommend you watch these uh, two YouTubes. They're short. Now, the last part deals with reactions of acetic, steric, actually, here, we're just doing oleic. I forgot to knock this out. There's no steric here. This acetic and oleic acid. And you'll be investigating interesting reaction. Now, what we know is if you take a carboxylic acid and react it with a base, and this I already went through in class, you'll get a carboxylate anion plus water. And these, this is a neutralization, and therefore acid base, you get a salt. And what we're gonna, what also we're doing here, um, for my class lecture. Remember, what we do in the lab is never on a test. In the lecture, is lithium, sodium, or potassium. But now let's look at something interesting. What if we use a different base, or do the following reaction. And here, if you notice in the lab, you're first going to react a carboxylic acid with sodium hydroxide. And then afterward, you'll react it with magnesium sulfate. What does that do? Well, in the first part, you'll do this. And now, in that beaker, you'll have this compound. And if I react it with magnesium sulfate, let me remind you magnesium is a plus two cation. Sulfate is a minus two 
polyatomic anion. And what you would get and this one of those rare times Dr. White's going to balance it. The students get all upset if I don't. Is since each carboxylate anion is a minus one charge, you need two of them to form this salt. Plus, you'd also get, which is water soluble sodium sulfate. This is water soluble. Now, if you think about acetic acid and oleic acid, the size of R is different, the molecular weight or number of carbons. And here, it's a certain molecular weight. Here, this is going to be double, at least, maybe more. So how does that affect water solubility? Well, you do the experiment. And for acetic acid, the solution remains clear and homogeneous. When you do it with oleic acid and you add the magnesium sulfate, you get this really nasty, ugly, chunky, white, solid coating the wall of the Erlenmeyer. At that point, I'd be walking around the lab and I couldn't find a YouTube video. I tried and say to everybody, you know what you just made? And they say, no bathtub scum. And that's the chemical reaction. Your soap is a carboxylate anion, and it works better with magnesium, but the same thing happens with calcium plus two. In your water, there's calcium, and that forms a precipitate that coats your bathtub with the scum that is hard to clean out. Now, it's time for a public service announcement from Dr. White. Now, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll wait until Monday because I'm running late and I promise I get you out. On Monday, uh, first of all, let's finish the lab. And here's the results. And what you have to do is answer the questions at the end. Don't forget the lab, this lab is due a week from today. Make sure you're handy in labs look at D2L, check that the labs you've handed in, I've already graded, that should be in D2L. For those of you who haven't, I'll send out an email saying, because of the virus, I'm gonna loosen up a little. Don't tell anybody I'm being nice over my image around here. But hand in the labs, I won't take any penalty points. If you can't hand it in through assignment, just attach it to an email as a single PDF file, and I'll still grade it. Don't tell anybody I'm being nice. Now, what I'll do on Monday, and somebody remind me, I will tell how many of you have ever washed, cleaned out a bathtub with soap scum on it? Is it fun? No. Well, I'm an organic chemist a number of years ago. I'm saying, why am I sitting here scrubbing here? There must be an easier way. You're an organic chemist. Think about it. I thought about it and said, oh my God, why didn't I do that? I came up with a method. You can buy the stuff from any supermarket. That actual scrubbing time and all that is about three or four minutes, if that long. And that's with the thickest scum on there. Actual, from the time you start to finish, is about 20, 25 minutes. But some of it is spraying some hot water, putting a chemical, letting it sit for 10 minutes. 15 minutes and then scrubbing it a little and washing it down. It's like this. Do I still like doing bathtubs? Nah, but it's a lot quicker and a lot easier. With that, I'm going to let you go and have a nice rest of the day, rest of the week. Oh, I better end up on a good note. Game doesn't be healthy. I'll see you on Monday. Don't forget to do the problem set. And don't forget tonight, I have my office hours, so if you have any questions, stop by, because it's always true in my life. There's no such thing as a dumb question. Bye now. Game design. Or as the Germans say, Auf Wiedersehen.